You guys ready? We're ready. All right, let's jump into it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. amen. Know that the Lord works wonders for the faithful. The Lord hears when I call out. Tremble and do not sin. Pun your beds, ponder in silence. Offer fitting sacrifice and trust in the Lord. That's Psalm 4. Lord, we pray that this evening we would offer this scripture study to you with hearts full of love and praise for the gift of your word. I thank you so much for everything that you have revealed to us in these scriptures, especially for your covenant with King David. And I ask for your, your help this evening to understand this text. Lord Jesus Christ, be present now and let your Holy Spirit bow all hearts in love and truth today to hear your word and keep your way. Give us the grace to grasp your word that we may do what we have heard. Instruct us through the scriptures, Lord, as we draw near, O God, adored. To God the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit, three in one. To you, O blessed Trinity, be praised throughout eternity. Amen. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 9. Did you guys do your, do your homework? Did you compare uh, those verses from 1 Samuel uh, with Luke? Did you see how Luke talks about Jesus as if he's a new Samuel? As Samuel grew in wisdom you know, before God and men uh, and in stature, so Jesus does the same thing. Uh, what was another parallel? The Magnificat, Hannah's, Hannah's uh, has her Magnificat in 1 Samuel's uh, chapter 2, and Mary's Magnificat mirrors Hannah. Yeah. Hannah was given this miraculous child, this child miraculously, you know, by God's intervention. Again, we see God working through women who are barren and want to have children, uh, such as uh, Rebecca, who is barren for how many years? No, not eight, not eighty. No, Rebecca, not Sarah, but Rebecca. You have to go back and look. I'm not going to tell you. And then, but then Sarah was barren, and she hadn't had a child, and she had one at the age of ninety, and that was, well, she had Ishmael before she had Isaac, um, and then we have um, we have Hannah. And so the, Luke is showing us by Mary's Magnificat that Jesus, that this is a miraculous birth, that this is not just like, you know, the inspired, you know, conception of Jesus or that he was just born just, you know, this is just, you know, he's, he's showing that the, the birth of Jesus is a miracle, that Mary truly conceived by the Holy Spirit and not by a man. And so the virgin birth is central it's fundamental, it's foundational to what we believe as Christians. So we see Luke using Samuel as a backdrop, as he teaches us in his gospel. And if we look at 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 15, 1 Samuel chapter 9, 15, we read, The day before Saul's arrival, the Lord had given Samuel the revelation. At this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, whom you are to anoint as commander of my people Israel. So which of the 12 tribes is Saul from? Benjamin. So is Saul a Jew? No, he's not. Because if he was from Judah, he would be a Jew. But he's from Benjamin. So he's a Benjaminite. If he was from Levi, he would be a Levite. Okay, I want for you guys to think tribal here. Because we get in the New Testament, this is going to be important. Okay, now, who in the New Testament is named Saul from the tribe of Benjamin? Paul. 
No, not Paul, Saul. Saul Paul. So Saul is Paul's Hebrew name, and Paul is Saul Paul's Greek name or Roman name. Okay, so Paul's a Roman citizen, and that you would do this. You know, like, if I was in Mexico, I'd be Carson. Here, I'm Carson. If I was in Italy, I'd be Carsoni. You know, it's like a difference in names wherever you go. It's the same thing with Jesus. The, the Hebrew form of Jesus is Joshua, and the Greek form of Jesus is Jesus. That's what, where we get that from. So Paul was most likely named after King Saul, who was, you know, this great commander of the, uh, the, who came from the tribe of Benjamin. And let's, turn to, let's look at the next chapter, chapter 10, verse 1. And we have the anointing of Saul. Then from a flask he had with him, Samuel poured oil on Saul's head. He also kissed him, saying, The Lord anoints you commander over his heritage. You are to govern the Lord's people Israel and to save them from the grasp of their enemies round about. So, why is, how is Saul anointed? With oil, a flask. It, it, was a, it was quite a bit of oil. I mean, it dripped down, it poured down over him. And uh, kings, priests, and prophets were anointed with oil in the Old Testament. And so we have Saul, and he's anointed. Okay. What is the Hebrew word for the anointed one? Messiah. Messiah. Very good. Okay. Um, in, let me see here, in, uh, do, 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 in Hebrew, it's, uh, if you want to say it, you know, most precisely, it's Mashiach. Mashiach. And this is where we get Messiah from. And that is the anointed one. Is Saul the Messiah? Come on, it's yes or no? Yes. It, yes, yes. Saul, it, no, at the time, he was the Messiah. That's right, he was the anointed one. The Lord's anointed. The Lord's anointed. And David, will see, respected Saul as the Lord's anointed. Specifically, that's what David calls him. Okay, so Saul was the Messiah. It's, it's okay to say that. And what is the Greek word for the anointed one? Yes, Christos. Okay, so we have Christos is the Greek word for the, anoint, the anointed one. And that's where we get Christ from. So whether we say Christ or Messiah, we're saying the same thing, whether we use Greek or Hebrew, and we're saying the anointed one. So when we say, you know, we're waiting for the Messiah to come, this isn't some mystical word, you know, we're just kind of like, ooh, the Messiah, you know. But no, we, we mean specifically the anointed one. This is going to be very important. Okay, so Saul is appointed as the Lord's anointed as a king. And remember Samuel, his sons were supposed to continue being judges over Israel. But the people rejected Samuel's sons because they were wicked. And the people said, no, we want a king over us. We want to be like the rest of the nations, have a king to lead us in battles. And so, you know, Samuel was... He was, he was just kind of hurt, you know? He was like, well, what, do you, what do you mean? And the Lord, the Lord told Samuel in a vision, he said, Samuel, it's not you that they're rejecting, it's me. Go ahead and give them what they want, but warn them what's going to happen. They're, you know, that the king's going to take your daughters and your sons to be servants, and you're going to have to pay a double tithe, a tithe now to the Levites and a tithe to the king, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so... Uh, so that giving Israel a king was concessionary in a certain sense. But God is going to bring great good out of the, the people's uh, own selfishness. Again, we see providence at work. God taking everything into account according to his plan. God is working with the people, with their, with their weaknesses. And we should see this in the way that we, we govern others. You know, governments, uh, we, should, we should work with people's weaknesses and raise them up. Um, it's just a, a little aside, the, something that the Greeks knew. Um, and so, let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13. And we have Saul, you know, Saul's, Saul's made the king, and normally when you're made a king, that means that 
you know, divine right, the royal blood. Your sons are going to succeed you. But Saul loses the dynasty. He loses, he's going to continue as king, but his son will not reign after him because Samuel instructed Saul not to offer sacrifice and that Samuel would offer the sacrifice at the appointed time. But in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 9, we hear that Saul said, bring me the holocaust and peace offerings. And he offered up the holocaust. That's huge. You could, just, you could highlight that. He offered up the holocaust. He had just finished this offering when Samuel arrived. Saul went out to greet him. And Samuel asked him, what have you done? Saul replied, when I saw that the men were slipping away from me, since you had not come by this specified time with the Philistines assembled at Michmash, I said to myself, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, Gilbal, and I have not yet sought the Lord's blessing. So in my anxiety, I offered up the Holocaust. Samuel's response was, you have been foolish. Had you kept the command of the Lord your God gave you, the Lord would now establish your kingship in Israel as lasting, meaning that his sons would succeed him. But as things are, your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and has appointed him commander of his people because you broke the Lord's command. Samuel is immediately... Let me see here. Oh, quite, not quite yet. I'm not going not to go there quite yet. But so we get uh, King Saul is reproved. And so Saul loses the dynasty. So his heir will not succeed him. And then Saul loses the kingship after that. Not, not just his dynasty, but he, he's going to lose the throne. Because he did what? No. He lost a dynasty because he offered sacrifice. But now he's going to lose his very own kingship. He's going to lose the throne for himself. Now he's going to be, you know, before it was just his heir, you know, won't succeed him. But now he's going to lose the kingship because he did what? What was the second blunder Saul committed? I'm sorry, go ahead. He didn't obey the Lord's command. And what was that command? He should put God first. But there's something specific. Something specific. Very good, very good. He was commanded to put the city of Amalek, basically to destroy the, the evil inhabitants of Amalek, to destroy everyone and every animal, right? That was the command of the Lord. It was, it was one of those concessionary laws from Deuteronomy called harem warfare. And in the Old Testament, it would say, that someone or a city would be put under, quote-unquote, the ban. And Amalek uh, is put under the ban. And Amalek's king is Agag. Gag me. His name is Agag. And uh, Saul spares Agag's life as, long, as well as the best of the, you know, the sheep, the cattle, the oxen, etc., the, and, and they're fat. Remember, the fat, the, the fat ones are the best. Remember, why, why was, why was uh, Cain's sacrifice not acceptable? Well, he didn't, offer the, he didn't offer the fat, it says. And so, so Saul uh, does not carry out the, the, uh, the Lord's command. And this is in 1 Samuel chapter 13. I'm sorry, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15. Verse 9, Saul and his troops spared Agag and the best of the fat sheep and oxen and the lambs. They refused to carry out the doom on anything that was worthwhile, dooming only what was worthless and of no account. Then the Lord spoke to Samuel, I regret having made Saul king, for he has turned me from me and has not kept my command. At this, Samuel grew angry and cried out to the Lord all night. Wow, Samuel was, he was pretty mad, you know, crying out to the Lord all night. Early in the morning, he went to meet Saul, but was informed that Saul had gone to Carmel, where he erected a trophy in his own honor. <laughs> and that on his return, he had passed on and gone down to Gilgal. When Samuel came to him, Saul greeted him. The Lord bless you. I have kept the command of the Lord. But Samuel asked, 
What then is the meaning of this bleeding of sheep that comes to my ears? And the lowing of oxen that I hear. Sound effects included. Saul replied, they were brought from Amalek. The men spared the best sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we have carried out the ban on the rest. The ban. Samuel said to Saul, stop. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Speak, he replied. Samuel then said, though little in your own esteem, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? Okay, he just erected a trophy in his own honor. This is sarcasm. You know, though little in your own esteem, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king of Israel and sent you on a mission saying, go and put the sinful Amalekites under a ban of destruction. Fight against them until you have exterminated them. Why then have you disobeyed the Lord? You have pounced on the spoil, thus displeasing the Lord. Saul answered Samuel, I did indeed obey the Lord and fulfill the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought back Agag and I have destroyed Amalek under the ban. But from the spoil, the men took sheep and oxen, the best of what had been banned to sacrifice to the Lord their God in Gilgal. <laughs> you know, Saul is still unrepentant. He's like, I, but I still did it. I, I just, spare, it, come on. It's, it. But Samuel said, does the Lord so delight in holocausts and sacrifices as in obedience to the command of the Lord? Obedience is better than sacrifice and submission than the fat of rams. For a sin like divination is rebellion, and we'll see that Saul will commit the sin of divination later on. This is kind of like a, a prophetic foretelling of what Saul's going to do. And presumption is the crime of idolatry. Because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he too has rejected you as a ruler. So, so Saul's, I mean, you know, Saul's curriculum vitae is, is just going downhill. You know, it's, it's not going well for him. So Saul ends up being rejected by the Lord and in verse 16, Samuel is sent straight to where? I'm sorry, in, in chapter 16, where is Samuel sent straight to? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Now, why is Bethlehem famous in the time of Jesus? <laughs> it's the city of David. It's David's birthplace, right? Well, here's its first uh, mention here in the Bible, and why is Samuel sent there to find David. God wants to bring the man after God's own heart, and he wants to anoint him. So we see in verse 1 of chapter 16, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve for Saul, whom I have rejected as king of Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem, for I have chosen my king from among his sons. So in the town of Bethlehem, and Bethlehem means what? House of, who said that? Way to go, Augie. All right. House of bread. This is what it means. And this is why Jesus, the bread of life, is going to come from the house of bread. And so in Bethlehem, we have Jesse. Jesse is David's father. Okay. Now, what happens, basically, is that Jesse brings out all of his sons before Samuel. And the Lord says, no, not him. No, not him. No, definitely not him. Not him. And they, they get down to the, to, the, to the last, I mean, basically to the end. And let's turn to verse 11. Then Samuel asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? Jesse replied, there is still the youngest who is tending the sheep. S tending the sheep. So David is a shepherd. And so Jesus is going to be the good shepherd. Very good. It's one of the seven I am sayings in John's gospel. I am the bread of life. I am the true you know, vine. I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. There are seven I ams. And Jesus is using the I am, the divine name, Yahweh, for himself when he says I am. Again, it's John showing the divinity of Jesus Christ. And so this is uh, verse 11. Samuel asked Jesse, are all, these are all the sons you have? They're still the youngest who is tending the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send for him. We will not begin the sacrificial banquet until he arrives here. Jesse sent and had the young man brought to him. He was ruddy, a, a youth handsome to behold and making a splendid appearance. The Lord's, I wonder if David had this commissioned, you know, for Samuel. 
Make sure you say I have a splendid appearance. (laughs) The Lord said, there, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel, with the horn of oil in, in hand, anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. When Samuel took his leave, he went to Ramah. The spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and he was tormented by an evil spirit sent by the Lord. (laughs) So we have the spirit departs from Saul and goes on to David. And we're told that the spirit comes down upon David at his anointing. Who is David anointed by? Samuel. Samuel, we're told in the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel, that he took a Nazarite vow. And the Nazarites would not cut their hair. They took a vow before the Lord, and they, wouldn't, and they would not cut their hair. They let it grow. Who was another famous person in the Old Testament who took a Nazarite vow? His power came in his hair. Samson. All right, Samson. Very good. So we have Samson and Samuel. Samuel was, had taken a Nazarite vow, you know, so he didn't drink wine at all, or, any, or, any, or grapes, or raisins even. You know, this is part of the Nazarite vow. Is there anybody in the New Testament who did not drink strong, strong drink, took, presumably took the Nazarite vow, we, we were, were pretty sure, and ended up, and ended up uh, baptizing uh, David's heir, John the Baptist? So we have John the Baptist, and do we have a time when the Spirit descends upon Jesus? The baptism. Yeah, the anointing with the Spirit, because Jesus is not anointed over the head with oil, right? I mean, there's the instance near his passion where the woman, you know, with the alabaster jar or whatever, anoints his, anoints his feet with the, or her hair, and, uh, you know, there's like this anointing, and it prefigures his burial, but there's no real anointing with a flask of oil or a horn of oil upon Jesus. Jesus' anointing happens at baptism, when the, when the Spirit comes upon him from above and anoints him, and Christ is, give, is like almost kind of installed in office as the Christ at his baptism. When John the Baptist, a Nazarite, someone, a Nazarite had baptized him. And then Jesus will say in, in John chapter 3 that, Man must be born of water in the spirit to enter the kingdom of God. And the word used uh, for uh, one must be born blank of water and spirit, that word, he says, one must be born onothen is the Greek word. In John chapter 3, verse 3, and John chapter 3, verse 5, the Greek word is onothen. One must be born onothen. Nicodemus thinks that Jesus means again. So Nicodemus goes, well, how can a man like re-enter his his mother's womb and come back out again? That doesn't make sense. And Jesus says, Jesus restates in a different way what he had just said. And onothin is one of those words that has more than one definition. It means both again and from above. And so Jesus says one must be born, he's using the the deeper spiritual meaning of onothin. Uh, Nicodemus is using more of the like common understanding. John does this several times. The woman at the well, Jesus says, I will give you zoe water. Water that is zoe. Well, zoe means both living and flowing. She thinks that he means flowing and Jesus means living. John does this with double meanings in his gospel. Well, I, uh, Nicodemus thinks it's again. Jesus means from above. And Jesus says, one must be born onothen. One must be born from above to enter the kingdom of God, to see the kingdom of God, of water and spirit. Well, where where was there water and spirit in John's gospel? John chapter 1, where Jesus was baptized and the spirit came upon Jesus. And at the end of chapter 3 of John's gospel, the same where you have the discourse between Jesus and Nicodemus, guess what it says Jesus went and did with his disciples? Baptized. The context is baptism. It's called an inclusio, where you put the theme at the beginning and the end, and then you talk about it in the middle. This is what John is doing in his gospel. So again, we see that Jesus is going to be anointed Messiah and Christ by the Spirit at his baptism in the Jordan. Okay, let's get back to the the text here. So we see David is a shepherd. He's ruddy and, and made a splendid appearance, and he's handsome to behold. 
Sounds like me. Come on, it's just a sore joke. Okay, so here we are. Um, let's go to... Uh, do, do, do. David becomes Saul's what? What does David do for Saul? What's his position in Saul's army? The armor bearer. Yes. David becomes Saul's armor bearer. And because David slew Goliath, the women sing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands. And Saul becomes envious of David. Saul wants to kill David. He says, oh, why did he sing I, I killed my thousands, but David killed his tens of thousands. I, I've killed a lot. And, and he gets envious, and he wants to kill David, his armor bearer. And so David is being pursued by Saul many times in 1 Samuel. But David does not want to touch the Lord's anointed. The first time, David is sleeping in a cave with his men, and Saul comes into the cave to relieve himself. David sneaks up behind him while he's taking a whiz and cuts off a piece of his, you know, his tunic or whatnot. And Saul leaves and you know, goes down a while. And David peers out of the cave and he goes, The Lord has delivered you into my hand this day, but I will not touch the Lord's anointed. Why are you pursuing me? I'm not going to do anything to you. So, you know, Saul says, Oh, everything's cool. You know, I, I repent. Well, of course not. That's not what happens. Saul gets mad at him again and, and keeps pursuing him. And another time, Saul ends up sleeping in the desert with, I believe it was his water jug and his sword. Uh, his sword was in the ground near his head. And they're out there in the desert. And David goes, who wants to go with me? Let's sneak into the camp and take his sword. And he does that. He, he takes, it, takes one of his best men. And they sneak into the camp. And David takes the sword from, by Saul's head and his water jug. Is it a water jug? Do you guys know the narrative? Yeah. I think that's what it is. And he, go, he goes out, and then he goes, hey, guys, wake up. And everybody's like, whoa, what? what? He goes, the Lord has delivered me into your hand again. You know, you guys can't defend your king. We were right there with his own sword. We could have beheaded him. We could have impaled him, but we didn't. Why? Because he's the Lord's anointed. We're not going to touch him. Okay, so no matter how bad the person is in the office of the Messiah, of, being, of holding the kingship over Israel, David respects not Saul as a person. Saul's a, he's an idiot. He's just, I mean, he's just, he's a, like a villain. But David respects the fact that he's the Lord's anointed. Having that position is very, very important for David. Yes? Why did he get to keep the position when I thought uh, the position of kingship was stripped from him? Yes, the position of kingship was stripped from him, but it doesn't happen immediately. The Lord takes the spirit from him, and he he allows the course of events to go a little bit further before he disposes him of his kingship. Um, And we're going to get to that uh, in just a moment. In fact, we're going to get to it right now. Let's look at, let's let's go a little bit further in the, uh, I was about to say the gospel, but we're we're talking about the the Old Testament Messiah. By the way, Isaiah, in the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah only speaks of one person as being the Messiah. All throughout Isaiah, he uses the word Messiah, or the anointed one, once. Who does he use it in reference to? The prophet Isaiah. No, it's not Jesus. Who does Isaiah call the anointed one? The Persian king Cyrus. In all of Isaiah, a little bit of tidbit of trivia there for you. You guys, will, you guys will be going all through Isaiah tonight going, no, 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 I know it, it says some. Okay. Yes. I, that was implied, yes. Yes, yes. That when you hold an office in the New Testament, that office is still to be respected even though the person can be a scoundrel. This is why we can have popes like the Medicis you know, in the Middle Ages, who had orgies in the Vatican, but yet we still respect the office. It's not that we respect those men. I mean, I would want to kill them if I was there, but I probably wouldn't because I respect the, the office. And this is why when a bishop has a ring and we kiss the ring of the bishop, we're not honoring the bishop, we're honoring the office because that ring is a symbol of his office of authority being a successor of the apostles. Very good. Okay, let's look at uh, chapter 28. The Lord has not been talking to Saul. He hasn't gone through any prophets to talk to Saul. Saul's been waiting. You know, he he wants to 
he wants a word from the Lord. And the Lord won't, won't appear to him. Well, Saul had kicked all of the divinizers, all of the witches and the warlocks out of town. You know, he cleaned house. But now Saul is getting desperate. He wants a word from the Lord. So what does he do? He goes down to the local tarot card reader. Seriously. This is what happens. And, and don't you guys think for a moment that tarot card reading and calling, conjuring up spirits is just fake? Yes, there are fakes out there who do that to make money, you know. But there are people who really do consult demons and really do get uh, preternatural spirits uh, through preternatural knowledge. And so um, that is very real. And this is why the church uh, condemns things such as horoscopes and tarot card reading and all this stuff that opens you up uh, to the dark side. I'm, I know I'm using Star Wars language here. Preternatural would be, the church, when she speaks of supernatural, she means from God. Preternatural comes from angels. Uh, it could be good or bad, and usually it's, it's used in a bad sense. Um, so preternatural is like an angelic power. Because we know that there are, no, there, there are no such thing as just cosmic forces out there that these people consult. These mediums are fallen angels. They are demons. Now, they might, they might you know, say that they're someone's spirit from long past, you know. But no, demons are incredibly knowledgeable. I, I, have, a, I have a video called Interview with an Exorcist. I'm going to show it to the parish uh, sometime soon. It's really, really cool. Okay, so Saul, he dresses up as like a layman, and he sneaks, sneaks out of the castle, and he goes to the Witch of Endor in verse 8 of chapter 28. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and set out with two companions. They came to the woman by night, and Saul said to her, Tell me my fortune through a ghost. Conjure up for me the one I ask you to. But the woman answered him, You are surely aware of what Saul has done in driving the mediums and fortune tellers out of the land. Why then are you laying snares for my life to have me killed? But Saul swore to her by the Lord, As the Lord lives, you shall incur no blame. Then the woman asked him, Whom do you want me to conjure up? And he answered, Samuel. Samuel's been dead for a while now in the narrative. When the woman saw Samuel, she shrieked at the top of her voice and said to Saul, You have deceived me. You are Saul. But the king said to her, Have no fear. What do you see? The woman answered Saul, I see a preternatural being rising from the earth. What does he look like? asked Saul. And she replied, It is an old man who is rising, clothed in a mantle. Saul knew that it was Samuel. And so he bowed so he bowed face to the ground in homage. Samuel then said to Saul, Why do you disturb me by conjuring me up? Saul replied, I am in great straits, for the Philistines are waging war against me, and God has abandoned me. Since he no longer answers me through prophets or in dreams, I have called you to tell me what I should do. To this Samuel said, But why do you ask me if the Lord has abandoned you and is with your neighbor? The Lord has done to you what he foretold through me. He has torn the kingdom from your grasp and has given it to your neighbor, David. And immediately what happens? Saul goes into battle against the Philistines. He dies as well as his two sons, one of which is Jonathan, who is a very righteous man. In fact, when Jonathan and David enter into a covenant and they exchange clothing, it's symbolic of Jonathan saying, I give you what would be my kingship. I give you what, what should, you know, in a natural way should be, I should get the kingship, being the firstborn son of the king. But when he gives David his cloak, it's like saying, you know, I, I, just, I know that you're the Lord's anointing. I know the Lord has chosen you. I mean, they're best friends. I'm sure David has told him about his anointing. And so he says, well, I give you my cloak. And David gives him his thing, and, and Jonathan humbles himself before the Lord's choice. And so Jonathan is upheld in the Old Testament uh, as a saint to emulate. So Saul dies in battle. And then this brings us to 2 Samuel chapter 1. And what it begins with the report of Saul's death. It says that after his death, you know, David uh, mourned not only Jonathan, but also the Lord's anointed, Saul. And then a youth came to report the death of Saul to him. And uh, let's see here. Let's look at um, verse 5. 
of 1 Samuel chapter 1. Then David said to the youth who was reporting to him, How do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? The youthful informant replied, It was by chance that I found myself on Mount Gilboa and saw Saul leaning on his spear with chariots and horsemen closing in on him. So Saul's committing suicide. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't want to be... Um, He doesn't want to be captured alive or to be tortured or whatever would happen to him. He turned around and seeing me, called me to him. When I said, here I am, he he asked me, who are you? And I replied, an Amalekite. Okay, there's one of the Amalekites is still alive. You you can see where the narrative uh, fits together here. Uh, The Amalekites were not put under the ban. Then he said to me, stand up to me, please, and finish me off, for I am in great suffering yet fully alive. So basically Saul says to this Malachite youth, you know, finish me off. So I stood up to him and dispatched him, for I knew that he could not survive his wound. I removed the crown from his head and the armlet from his arm and brought them here to my Lord. David seized his garments and rent them, and all the men who were with him did likewise. They mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the soldiers of the Lord of the clans of Israel because they have fallen by the sword. Then David said to the young man who had brought him the information, where are you from? He replied, I am the son of an Amalekite immigrant. David said to him, how is it that you were not afraid to put forth your hand to desecrate the Lord's anointed? David then called out one of the attendants and said to him, come, strike him down. And the youth struck him a mortal blow. Meanwhile, David said to him, you are responsible for your own death, for you testified against yourself when you said, I dispatched the Lord's anointed. Wow. Wow. I mean, this youth thinks that he's bringing good news to David. You know, you can be king now. You know, he was already going to die. But no, David is, is, he's taking this very seriously. No, you killed the Lord's anointed. This is huge, serious stuff. Then in chapter 2 of 2 Samuel, David is anointed at Hebron, which is a city. And David was anointed king over what? king over all of Israel, right? No, no, just Judah. David, for the first seven years of his kingship, reigned over just Judah. Okay, for seven years. And let's turn to chapter 5, verse 1. Some time has passed, and we read... All the tribes of Israel came to David in Hebron. Okay, all the tribes. Here we are, your bone and your flesh. This is covenant language. Here we are, your bone and your flesh. In days past when Saul was our king, it was you who led the Israelites out and brought them back. In other words, you were successful. We didn't die on the battlefield. You brought us back. And the Lord said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and shall be commander of Israel. When all the elders of Israel came to David in Hebron, King David made a covenant with them there before the Lord, and they anointed him king of Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 40 years until he was 70. Seven years and six months in Hebron over Judah, and 33 years in Jerusalem over all Israel and Judah. Okay, so he reigns over Judah for seven years and six months. And then he reigns over all 12 tribes for 33 years. And the first seven years are in Hebron. And where are the last 33 years? In Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, before it was Jerusalem, what was it known as? We're told in like the next couple of verses. Jerusalem was known as Zion. It was a Jebusite stronghold. Okay? The Jebusites. You know, and the Jebusites are mocking the, the Israelites. They're saying, you know, the, the, uh, what, what do they say? They say, uh, our blind and our lame can, can take you guys. You're, you're pathetic. But how does, how does David's men take this Jebusite stronghold of Zion? Who's read their Old Testament? They went up a water shaft, 
And that's how they got into the city without having to go over the walls. They went through a water shaft. They take the city of Zion, and David makes Jerusalem his capital. And what's really interesting is that Jerusalem is not really in one of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's kind of, neut- it's kind of right on the border of Benjamin and Judah. And so it's kind of like neutral territory, sort of. It's kind of like when our, when our founders wanted to found a capital, they didn't want to choose one state because they didn't want to uh, make one state seem more important than another, so they came up with the District of Columbia, D.C. I think the book uses this analogy, doesn't it? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, now we're going to get in some really cool stuff. Okay, you guys ready? I've been, I've been waiting for this. All right. Who builds David's palace? No, David's palace. Not the temple, but David's own castle. Hiram, the king of Tyre. A Gentile. Not an Israelite. And it's made with, you know, the cedars of Lebanon. You guys know, if you've ever, if you sing or read the Psalms a lot, the cedars of Lebanon are a big deal. I guess it was some really prime real estate, you know? It was like singing about, you know, lakeside property at Somerville or something, you know? It's, it's, uh... Okay, let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 6. Did I give you this as homework to read? No, I didn't? Okay, 2 Samuel chapter 6. I'm going to go ahead and erase some of this stuff up here on this board. It's in the book homework. Okay, let's, let's look at uh, what had happened is that when Saul was killed, remember the Philistines won. The Israelites were not led back from battle. They died. And the ark was captured. So the ark has been in the, with the Philistines this whole time. But now David says, we got to get the ark back. Great kingdom, but the Lord's ark. D- chapter 6. <laughs> David again assembled all the picked men of Israel, 30,000 in number. Then David and all the people who were with him set out for Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God. Now, my New American Bible is kind of dynamic, so it doesn't say what most translations say, uh, which is that David and, and those who were with him arose and went. And in the Greek version of the Old Testament, these were particular words that meant arose and mint. I'm sorry, arose and mint. Uh, arose and chocolate. No, arose and went. And they set out to Baal Judah, which wasn't, like, you know, you had, uh, anyway, so this is, a, this is a town in Judah. And Judah was kind of hilly, so it was in the, in the hill country. And then we see in verse we, we see that when, the, when they got the ark and they were bringing the ark back, someone, Uzzah, had, you know, he thought the ark was going to fall, so he, he like touches it to, to you know, to kind of, you know, s- to keep it, so it from falling. And Uzzah is struck dead on the spot because the ark of the Lord is not to be touched. It was carried with poles. It wasn't carried, you know, like this. It was carried with poles because you weren't to touch it. So he dies, and David gets kind of fearful. And he says in verse 9, David feared the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? Okay, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? And so, you know, he was kind of a, he was kind of scared. So it says in verse 11, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obedidam, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed Obedidam and his whole house. So David's kind of like, okay, everybody, someone just died. We're going to leave the ark here for three months, and we'll be, we'll be back to get it. But let's just, you know, this is getting kind of, this is becoming a mortal, a mortal affair. So the ark spends three months in the house of Obedidam, uh, the Gittite, in his house. Uh, and, then, and then finally when 
uh, verse 12, when it was reported to King David that the Lord had blessed the family of Obadidom and all that belonged to him, David went to bring up the Ark of God from the house of Obadidom into the city of David amid the festivities. As soon as the bearers of the Ark of the Lord had advanced six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. Then David, girt with a linen apron, came dancing before the Lord with abandon. As he and all the Israelites were bringing up the Ark of the Lord with shouts of joy into the sound of the horn. And the Ark of the Lord was entering the city of David. Saul's daughter, Michal, looked down through the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. So David, we're told, and remember, in the Greek Old Testament, specific Greek words are being used. David leapt. Leaped. Okay, let's turn to Luke chapter 1. Go ahead and put your finger there. You know, keep, keep, that, keep that chapter. Now, remember how Luke is using 1 Samuel to talk about Jesus? Well, he uses it to talk about Mary as well. Shh, shh. You're, kidding. you're, taking, my, you're taking my air out of my, ti- out of my tires. Now remember, First and Second Samuel is one work. They're not two separate works. Luke 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Verse 39. During those days, Mary set out and traveled. When it says Mary set out, it says literally, uses the same Greek words. Mary arose and went. To where? Where did she go? To the hill country in haste to a town of Judah, like Baal Judah. It's in the same, the same area, if you know your geography of the, of the Holy Land. Elizabeth's response is what? Verse 43. How, do, how does this happen to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Instead of saying ark, she says mother. Elizabeth does. How can the mother of my Lord come to me? If you want to flip all the way to verse 56, how long did Mary remain in the the house of Elizabeth? Three months in the house of Elizabeth. And what does John the Baptist do when Mary comes up before Elizabeth and, you know, He leaps, he leaps. He leaps. Yes. John the Baptist leaps. John leaps. And again, these are the same Greek words are used for arose and went and for leap. Luke is, you know, many times, you know, if, if we just read the New Testament, you know, without knowing the Old Testament, we just read the Old Testament, we just re- read Luke chapter 1, maybe from a really dynamic version, like the Living Word translation. You know, when we read it, we're like, okay, this is cool. Mary visits Elizabeth. Okay. And then you, co- you come across some people who have a deep, a deep veneration and honor for Mary, and you're like, hey, look, no. Mary's only a couple of places in the Bible. She's at the wedding of Cana. She's at the infancy narrative. She's at the cross, and that's it. The Bible says very little about her. Why, why do you guys make such a big deal about Mary? No. Luke made such a big deal about Mary. He says little, but he says it with great force. What are we supposed to infer from this? What, what is the typology? She's the Ark of the Covenant. Exactly. She's the Ark of the Covenant. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, right at the very end of chapter 11 of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. The Ark of the Lord had been, had been disappeared for six centuries. The Ark of the Lord was nowhere to be found. Six centuries, we're told. There's a tradition that Jeremiah had hid it when Jerusalem was going to be sacked by the Babylonians. And at the end, now, I'm sorry, at, yeah, at the end of Revelation 11, remember, there were no original chapter verses. I mean, chapter divisions. Chapter divisions were, in, were, were uh, given to the Bible by the Catholic Bishop of Canterbury. 
uh, uh, Stephen Langton, Archbishop Stephen Langton, and later on Robert Estienne, uh, a Parisian printer uh, in Paris, would, in, would insert verses into the Bible. But, so there was no chapter division here. We're told in verse 19 of chapter 11, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant could be seen in the temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a violent hailstorm. The Ark of the Covenant, guys, gone for six centuries. It's back. We found it. A great sign appeared in the sky. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was with child and wailed aloud in pain, and she labored to give birth. If you continue to read the narrative, there's no more mention of the Ark. Just this mention of this woman who gives birth to a child who's going to rule with an iron scepter, which is a quote, which is quoting Psalm 2, which is a royal Davidic psalm, which points forward to Christ. This woman gives birth to this child, and no more talk about the Ark of the Covenant. It's just boom, there it is, but then it just it's gone. Because John spent time with Mary. Remember, John, Jesus gave John at the cross care of his mother. And tradition has it that John built a chapel for her and a house in Ephesus. And you can go visit it today. Isn't this cool? And so John, who knows Mary, knows the Old Testament. Knows, and when God, when God built the Ark of the Covenant, he commanded cherubim. He, he commanded it to be built you know, as a box with gold and all this stuff. The, the, the ark was not plan A and then Mary was plan B. No, Mary is plan A. Mary is the horse that's, that's driving the cart of the ark. You just not put the cart before the horse. Mary comes first. God, Mary is God's plan to be the new ark of the covenant. And Jesus is God's plan to be the savior of the world. And then all throughout the Old Testament, God is teaching us about Jesus with Moses, with the prophets, with Samuel. And God is teaching us not just about Jesus, but also about Maria. Yes, the Ark of the Covenant. And so the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament was made out of gold. It was so holy. I mean, you touch it, you die. And if Mary is going to be the new Ark of the Covenant, why do you think that we think that she was sinless? Hmm. It's, it's not something that we created in the Middle Ages. This, is, this goes all the way back to the first century. This is, Luke is telling us this in his Gospel. We have Mary, the Ark of the Covenant, Jesus, the new Samuel. We have typology being used here, and it gets better all the way throughout Luke's Gospel. Oh, the typology is amazing. Let's look at Luke one thirty-five. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. It says, And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Overshadow you is, the Greek word is epischiazo. And remember, the apostles used the Greek Old Testament. And we know this because whenever Paul or one of the gospel authors quotes the Old Testament, many times the Old Testament version they quote is, is, a, is quite a bit different from other Old Testament versions that we have. Because we have two traditions that have come to us. We've had the Greek translations of the Old Testament in d- different forms, and clo- uh, together we kind of call this the Septuagint. There's not one Septuagint, there's different Greek translations. And then there's the Hebrew translations. Well, the Hebrew texts that have come to us from the Masorites, the Masorites were, 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 Hebrew, were, were Jews who lived in the, the, mi- the Middle Ages. Uh, the, the Hebrew texts that come to us are a little bit different in the Old Testament than the, the Septuagint texts, the, the Greek translations that we have, which are much older. The, the original manuscripts we have are much older. And the Septuagint uses certain phrases that are different than the Hebrew Bible. And so when you see somebody quote the Old Testament and the New Testament, you can tell whether they're using the Greek translation or the Hebrew translation. And many times in your footnotes, you might see 
uh, you know, for that particular quotation from the Old Testament, you might see LXX in your footnotes. That LXX is the Roman numeral for 70, for the Septuagint. Septuagint is a Greek word meaning 70. This is what it was known as, the 70. Because the tradition has it that 70 translators translated in Alexandria for the, Jew, the Greek-speaking Jews in Alexandria. And so we know that the people who wrote the New Testament used the Greek Old Testament, not the Hebrew Old Testament. And in the Greek Old Testament, you have these words that match up. Okay? This is why this is important. Because you, well, people would say, well, no, the, the, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. How can you be matching up Greek? Well, no, no, no. You had Greek translations in the time of the New Testament. Okay, so Epischiazo. Is that the Alexandrian? Yes, we're lo- the Greek Old Testament is the Alexandrian uh, Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. Jesus' family's Jewish. Right, like G- Jesus used the Septuagint. This is the Old Testament translation he used. Uh, he, he read and spoke Greek, uh, but he, his, his language that he used was Aramaic. You know, like I speak English, but I, I know how to write and, and how to speak in Greek. And, I mean, I'm sorry, no, I don't. In, in, uh, in, uh, in Spanish, for instance, you know? So it's not like it's totally lost on them. They, they, uh, but they would normally speak English. Okay, I, I'm not sorry. I'm a yes, go ahead. Very clear on this. Sorry, sure. Okay, you're saying that the original Gospels or all the Bible, New Testament, were written in Greek. Yes, the original, the, original. New, the original was written in Greek, though there is, a, there is an ancient tradition that Matthew's gospel was written in Hebrew, and then it was later translated to Greek. But the oldest manuscripts we have today are Greek of, of Matthew's gospel. But, there's a, but if you read the early church histories, uh, you have people giving witness to that Matthew's gospel was originally written by Matthew the apostle in Hebrew. And then it was translated, because he was writing it for uh, the Hebrew speaking and writing uh, Jews in Jerusalem during his time. But, but the other ones were written in Greek. Yes, yes. And so the manuscripts we have, the oldest copies are all in Greek of the New Testament. There you go. Well, unless if, like, Matthew's Gospel is possibly written in Hebrew and then it was translated to Greek, we lose the Hebrew copy, so we only have the Greek copy. And that becomes really important because of the meaning that would be attached in Greek that may not necessarily be in a different translation. Very good, yes. And that's why it's so confusing with different people's interpretations. Yes. And when you see things like key words being used in Greek, that points us to the Old Testament. Because sometimes these words are very unique. They're only used like in one other place in the, in the Greek Old Testament. And the author is using these words to point you back to the Old Testament. It's like a riddle. It's like we're going to decode the Bible, sort of. You know, it's like little riddles that they give you. Well, we have that the, the Holy Spirit epischiazo, Mary, overshadowed her. Well, we learn in Exodus 40:35. And Moses was not able to enter into the tabernacle of testimony because the cloud epischiazo it. And the tabernacle was filled with the glory of the Lord. Okay, so the tabernacle, the tent, in which the ark was inside of that, and the cloud, God's, God's presence, would come down into the tent and then, you know, you know, upon and inside the ark. And so... The same word is used for the, t- for the tabernacle in the Old Testament and for Mary, epischiazo. So we have like this divine presence going into Mary. And why, why is Mary the Ark of the Covenant? Well, in the Old Testament, the Ark was where God's presence was, where God was among his people. Well, Mary truly has not just some great angel like the Jehovah's Witnesses believe, or some great being is what Jesus is. No, Jesus is God. He is the divine and so she is the Ark of the Covenant because God's very own presence, his very own divinity is in her womb. Now we have almost no time to go. We have about 15 minutes. So let's turn to Deuteronomy 17, 18. Is this getting exciting? Okay, good, good. Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 18. Deuteronomy, chapter 17, verse 18. Are you guys getting better at flipping through the Bible? Is it coming more naturally to you? Good. Good. 
when he is enthroned in his kingdom, it's talking about the, you know, again, Deuteronomy is like a prophecy of what's to come. It's, a, it's going to prophesize the kingship. When he, the king, is enthroned in his kingdom, he shall have a copy of this law, Deuteronomy, made from the scroll that is in the custody of the Levitical priests. He shall keep it with him and read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and to heed and fulfill all the words of this law and these statutes. Okay, so the king, Saul or David or Solomon, is supposed to have their very own copy of Deuteronomy. In New Testament times, you, you wouldn't copy something so important as, as the New Testament. Actually, it's after the New Testament times when you start having the collections of the New Testament. Uh, you, you wouldn't copy this upon papyrus because papyrus, you know, you know, it wilted, it went away. It was like the really cheap uh, copy machine paper from Walmart. No, you'd go to Office Max and you get the card stock, you know, when you wanted to write, you know, sacred scripture on. And so the early Christians didn't copy onto papyrus, they copied onto vellum. Okay, well, this became the practice. At first they started with papyrus, and then later on they would move to using vellum. Vellum is the skin of, like, sheep or goats or cattle. Guess how many sheep it took uh, for a Christian monk uh, to create a Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, how many sheep did it take? A bunch. 9,000. Guess what? The Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, before Gutenberg invented his press, chained down the Bible. They did. Because they were expensive. I mean, yeah, so no one would take it. You go to the universities and the books are chained down. Old and New Testament. I mean, this would be like your house. Would you guys be willing to sell your house and go live in a tent, you know, in, your, in someone's backyard to just have a copy of the Bible? This is how, this is how expensive it was. So, for the, so it wasn't like every, every Israelite had a copy of Deuteronomy to read from, you know? I mean, the king has to get a special copy made for him, you know? And this is, this is pretty cool. You get your own Bible made for you. Well, not Bible, but the copy of the law, Deuteronomy. And so Deuteronomy is... Yeah, the king is to read it, and he's supposed to, you know, uh, he's supposed to heed the law. So we would know that David, being a man after God's own heart, would have Deuteronomy, and he would be reading Deuter- Deuteronomy, and he would be knowing what Deuteronomy has to say. Well, let's turn back to Deuteronomy 12, verse 10. Deuteronomy 12, verse 10. But after you have crossed the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you as a heritage, this is key, when he has given you rest from all your enemies round about and you live there in security, you are to bring your sacrifices to a central sanctuary, basically what's going to be the temple. This hasn't happened yet. Israel has taken the land, but they've been having all these enemies. In fact, David had to still conquer the Jebusite stronghold of Zion to get, to get his capital city, Jerusalem. But let's turn to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7. And we'll see that this key verse from Deuteronomy 12.10 is evoked in 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. When King David was settled in his palace... And the Lord had given him rest from his enemies on every side. There's Deuteronomy 12 right there being quoted. Okay, guys, it's time for the central sanctuary. It's time for the temple. Just as the law says, the king should know this. He has his own copy of Deuteronomy. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. He said to Nathan the prophet. Okay, so we have Nathan as the prophet now. Before you had like Samuel, now you have Nathan. Here I am living in a house of cedar, a cedar of Lebanon, while the ark of God dwells in a mere tent. David, Nathan answered the king, go do whatever you have in mind for the Lord is with you. But that night, the Lord spoke to Nathan and said, go tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, should you build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelled in a house from the day on which I led the Israelites out of Egypt to the present but I've been going about in a tent under cloth. In all my wanderings everywhere among the Israelites, did I ever utter a word to any one of the judges whom I charged to tend my people Israel to ask, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, 
Now, now God's speaking to Nathan this whole time. He's saying, you know, Now then, speak thus to my servant David. Verse 8. The Lord of hosts has this to say. It was I who took you from the pasture and from the care of the flock to be commander of my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you went, and I have destroyed all your enemies before you. And I will make you famous. No, that's what my New American Bible says, but it's not famous. In the Hebrew is, I will make your name great. I will make your shim great. Like the great ones of the earth. Now, where, where do we very first have this mention of making your name great? The promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. God promises to Abraham, I will make your name great. This is a Hebrew idiom for I will give you a kingdom, a dynasty. So now God's saying, okay, well, Solomon's dynasty, eh, but your dynasty, yeah. Verse 10, I will fix a place for my people Israel. I will plant them so that they may dwell in their place without further disturbance. Neither shall the wicked continue to afflict them as they did of old. Since the time I first appointed judges over my people Israel. I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also reveals to you that he will establish a baith for you. The Lord will establish a baith for you. Baith is a Hebrew word that can have three different definitions. It can mean a house, like a physical house, like a temple. It can also mean a family, you know, like the house of Weber, you know, Carson Weber, me. The house of Weber, so it can mean a family. By the way, I love answering the phone, you know. The Weber dynasty. <laughs> oh, you'd like the queen. Well, I need an heir to succeed me, so. Uh, the third point is that it can be a dynasty. In this instance, God means dynasty. I will make a house for you, you know, like the house of Habsburg or the house of Bourbon. Verse 12, and when your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your heir after you, sprung from your loins, and I will make his kingdom firm. It is he who shall build a baith for my name. Okay, so Solomon's going to build a baith, a temple. So there's a word play here. He will build a house for me. And I will make his royal th throne firm forever. Okay, so his throne will be firm forever. I will be a father to him, and he, sh he will be a son to me. So there's going to be some sort of God's fatherhood, and the king's going to be considered God's own son. And if he does wrong, I will correct him with the rod of men and with human chastisements. But I will not withdraw my favor from him as I withdrew it from your predecessor Saul, whom I removed from my presence." Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall stand firm forever. Nathan reported all these words in this entire vision to David. So the Lord basically says, no matter what kinds of sins you know, your successors commit, you know, I will correct them with the rod of chastisement, but the dynasty will remain. It will remain. This is, this is sure. This is steadfast. You know, Saul... You know, with your predecessor, he sinned and I took away his dynasty, but not so with your descendants. This dynasty will continue. And yes, your son, Solomon, he doesn't say Solomon, but this will be Solomon. Solomon will build a house for me. He will build the temple. So Solomon's going to be the temple builder. But, and basically, so remember back in Genesis, we had three chapters where God made three covenants with Abraham. What were those chapters in Genesis? We had Genesis 15, 17, and 22. The covenant in 15 is fulfilled in Moses, right? And the Mosaic covenant. What covenant is going to be fulfilled? This, this covenant in Genesis 17, where is that going to be fulfilled? 
Sarah is told that kings will come from her. In David, the Davidic covenant. So we're seeing, right now we're seeing this covenant in Genesis 17 being fulfilled through David and through David's son Solomon. And when will the covenant in in Genesis 22 be fulfilled? Through who? Jesus. Jesus. Right, and he's prefigured, his sacrifice is prefigured by Isaac kind of obediently uh, obeying his father Abraham and Isaac is bound. Okay, so this is going to be fulfilled in Jesus. So we have Genesis, we've gone through Moses and now we're into David. And we have, this is called the Davidic covenant. We have the Mosaic covenant and now we have the Davidic covenant. And it's going to continue through David's son. And David's going to have multiple sons. But the one son who gets the throne is going to be who? Solomon. Solomon. What does Solomon's name mean? It comes from the Hebrew word shalom, peace. He's, in a certain sense, a prince of peace. Hmm. Hmm. Verse 18, then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, who am I, Lord God? And who are the members of my house that you have brought me to this point? Yet even this you see is too little, Lord God. You have also spoken of the house of your servant for a long time to come. And this too is a Torah Adam. This too is a Torah Adam. Now we know our Hebrew now, right? Because we've been studying it. What does Torah mean? Law. Law. And what does Adam mean? Man. Or mankind or humankind. So this is a law for mankind. This isn't just for Israel. Like the Mosaic Covenant was for Israel, to separate Israel from all the nations. But no, the Davidic Covenant is going to be a law for all mankind. It's it's going to incorporate all nations. The temple is now going to have the court of the Gentiles, where the Gentiles are to come and worship at the court. We're going to have kings and queens from all over bringing tribute to Solomon. Why does Solomon have so many wives? These are political engagements. You know, you would marry somebody's daughter so that, you know, this, this is, these were political alliances that Solomon would enter into with other nations. So the Davidic covenant starts to become international, inclusive of other nations, of the Gentiles. So this Davidic king, the sons of David, are called son of David. They are each anointed. So they are each a Messiah. They are each a Christ. They each are also the Son of God in a metaphorical sense. So when Jesus is called, sometimes in the Gospels when he's called Son of God, that's not necessarily a divine title like you're God's eternal Son in the Trinity, right? No, it was a confession of kingship. That he was the son, of, the son of David. He held the kingship, and so he had this relationship with God. Now, I'm not, devi- I'm not denying you know, the divinity of Christ. Of course not. I've been supporting it the whole time. Yes, Christ is eternally the Son of God. But in the New Testament, Son of God did not necessarily, it was not necessarily a divine title. It was more of a title of kingship. Hmm, pretty cool, huh? Now, what we're going to do next week is we're going to look at Solomon, and oh, there's going to be some great prefigurements of the New Testament, and some things are really going to come alive. You're really going to see some things that are just going to, you, you know, it, it's kind of like this class is kind of like taking a huge vacuum and sucking all the fog out of the room to where the New Testament will become clearer. It's like taking all the dust off of the Bible, and now you'll be, when you sit at Mass, and you're listening to those four readings that we read on Sundays, you'll go, oh, that psalm, that's a Davidic psalm. That's talking about David's son. But now Jesus is David's son, so it's talking about Jesus. 
and you're going to go, oh yeah, that's from 1 Samuel. Oh, yeah, you know that on Mary's feast day, on the feast days that we have for Mary, guess where we read from? 2 Samuel chapter 6 and Luke 1. Carson. Yes, Margie. Before we go today, um, there was something that um, I wanted you to share with them that we learned at the last year's Bible study that is so cool, and I'm afraid we'll get off the ark and not get back to it again. Sure. Remember when they made the comparison between the contents of the first ark and then Mary? We'll still get there. We'll still get there? Okay. We'll get there in the New, so in the new Testament. Testament. But we can go ahead and give it tonight. There's, there's no reason to wait. We're told in the book of Hebrews that the Ark of the Covenant contained three things. And this will just take a moment. You don't have to, you don't have to, to leave. It contained three things. The first thing was a jar of manna that was incorrupt from the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. The second thing were the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And the third thing that the book of Hebrews tells us was in the ark is the rod or the staff of Aaron, which blossomed. The staff of Aaron is a symbol of Jesus our high priest, because Aaron was the high priest of Israel. The Ten Commandments are the, the, ten, the Decalogue, which are literally the ten words. A decade is ten years. Well, a decalogue is ten words. And so the Ten Commandments were the ten words of God, so we have the word of God in the ark. And the jar of manna is the bread that comes down from that came down from heaven, which your fathers ate in the wilderness, but they died, you know, John chapter six. And Jesus is the bread of life. The bread of life. And so these three things in the Ark of the Covenant prefigure Jesus, our high priest, the incarnate word of God, and our bread of life. One of the seven I am sayings in John's Gospel. Yes, and Mary carried Jesus in her, and so Mary is the ark. Yes, very good. And then Mary's also, we see at the end of Revelation 11. Ooh, exciting stuff. All right, well, let's, let's uh, close in prayer, and let's come back next week, and we can study some more. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, thank you so much for your covenant with David so that we have the surefire promise of a Messiah who would come. We thank you for finally, after six centuries of waiting, giving us the son of David. We are so thankful for the gift of your son, the word of God incarnate. May, through our study of, these, of the sacred page, may our eyes be opened to the eternal word who is present on every one of those pages. And again, may we not just simply grow in head knowledge and become smarter Christians, but may we become doers of the word, not deluding ourselves, as James says. And may we become holy more like unto Jesus. We ask for these graces humbly. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.